a committee. We don't have to agree on everything, absolutely not. We come from different political groups, uh, but we like the frankness um, uh, and your expertise. So thank you very much um, for being here and sharing that with us. It's uh, for sure very helpful for the drafting of our report. And that and you can stay if you want, because we have a second session um, that I think is, um, is, is, is a is a good complement to the first um, half of, uh, of the hearing of today. Um, as you know, this committee, we have all these hearings, we have missions, but we also have studies. Um, and in the beginning of um, uh, the, the work of this commission, the members, based on the discussion we had in the coordinators, um, um, uh, asked for a study on the impact of disinformation, misinformation and propaganda. Um, uh, and that uh, study uh, is commissioned by the Policy Department for Economic Science scientific and quality of life policies, a research branch of the DGI poll on the effect of communication and disinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have two of the four authors um, online with us today. That is Professor Diers Lawson and Ms. Jacob. Both of them have been working. Um, the other two authors are Pierre Hausmer and Adam Zagoni-Bosch. Um, but um, I gladly give now, I think, first the floor to Professor Diers Lawson and then Ms. Uh, Jacob um, to present the study. I think that would be very interesting. Professor, are you online? I, I am. The floor uh, is yours, Professor. Thank you. My name is Audrey Dears Lawson, and I'm a professor of risk and crisis communication at Christiania University College in Oslo, Norway. And it is my pleasure to be here to discuss the challenge of communicating in the EU throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is an example of a societal health crisis because it disrupted all aspects of our lives. Government's containment policies also changed the way that we worked, consumed, and interacted, at least in the short term, and potentially paved the way to new behaviors, policy, and procedures emer emerging across domains of social and work activities. Next slide, please. In this presentation, I will provide a summary of how we approach the analysis of key academic and professional research, and in so doing, I'll demonstrate the very clear pattern of effective and ineffective communication with citizens emerging across the countries. I'll also discuss a practical approach to building communication strategy during major health crises based on these best practices. Next slide, please. Because of the truly global nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has created a uniquely rich set of insights into major health crises. Accordingly, there has been an unprecedented amount of scientific and professional research published on it from around the world. This presentation summarizes 236 scientific publications and institutional reports related to communication in the COVID pandemic between 2020 and 2022, and including an exhaustive search for English language resources on the 11 countries included, nine as countries of focus and two for countries of comparison. Next slide, please. This figure summarizes the six best practices for communicating during the pandemic identified by scholars and practitioners. These best practices align with the WHO's framework for risk communication and community engagement. They also demonstrate transferable lessons for future health crises and disasters. So let's briefly talk about the highlights from some of these lessons learned. First, Effective pandemic communication strategies should focus on explaining to citizens what self-protective behaviors should be taken and why within each country's national context. Second, research suggests that in the pandemic and in other major health crises, governments should adopt a positive tone supporting citizen confidence in taking action communicating engagement, and also being responsive because defensive me messages are simply less effective. Third, there is an overall citizen preference for transparency and a constructive management of fear and anxiety. Fourth, in addition, two-way communication or citizen engagement was crucial in the different countries' relative communication success. Governments, this means that governments must also listen and respond to their citizens' communication needs. Fifth, 
It was also recognized that across countries, tailoring the messages to meet different demographics, information needs, and attitudes about the COVID pandemic and the self-protective behaviors was essential. For example, the minority communities within countries often simply have different information or communication needs. Sixth, finally, regarding Regardless of the relative success in managing the pandemic, trust in the communicating institutions is central, if not the central feature of communicating success. Next slide, please. In many ways, we know how the COVID-19 story has ended. Our job at this point is to understand how we can collectively do a better job to ensure that in future health crises, communication strategy is developed and applied to improve health outcomes. And as it's been stated already, while no nation's response was perfect, many of the countries, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, and Sweden, all demonstrated pretty consistently good communication practices whereas there were significant limitations or challenges in some cases with identified in Bulgaria and Hungary, with Lithuania having some very good practices as pointed out before, and also some challenges. Simply those countries though with comparatively poor communication strategies experienced more deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, one measure of the success of the communication effort should be based on the evidence of lower death rates and improved where we can improve citizen adoption of self-protective behaviors. Next slide. Overall, the literature supporting and analyzing the COVID-19 communication supports the need for an effective stakeholder relation management framework. This framework focuses on the interactions between the institutions managing COVID-19, citizen interests, and COVID-19 related issues that lead to self-protective behaviors being enacted. However, it also recognizes that these interactions occur within a complex information environment comprising multiple platforms, certainly social media, traditional media, and face-to-face -face communication, where there are often contradictory messages and different actors competing to capture citizen attention and thus including the disinformation and politicizing the pandemic that this other speakers in the previous session already addressed. Next slide. Research finds that issue related institutional citizen and information factors all affect message acceptance. This framework is really meant to be used as a contingency approach to building communication strategy. What I mean by a contingency approach is that agile crisis response using research informed message design and evaluation is especially important in complex situations like COVID because it allows governments and public health authorities to diagnose key communication challenges within a community or a broader population and then design messages to meet those citizen information needs. And this is reflecting one of the best practices that we've learned from COVID-19. So let me summarize some of the key findings from each of these factors. With regard to issue related factors across the EU, UK and US, citizen knowledge of their disease, their own perception of risks and the amount of control that they feel like they have all affected their willingness to take self-protective behaviors. Issue related factors influence strategies in several ways, but let me give you an example. Within the context of COVID, people were already afraid. So it just made more sense to focus on building positive messages about reducing risk rather than fear-based messages. In countries like England and Hungary, where fear-based messaging or strategies emphasizing punishment for non-compliance were dominated in a lot of cases, they had lower demonstrated levels of citizen compliance with instructional messages than those countries that focused on positive ones. With regard to institution-related factors, now, no matter whether we're talking about research that was analyzing high trust environments like in Sweden or explaining like political polarization eroded institutional trust and that was correlated with low levels of adoption of self-protective behaviors in countries like the US, the UK, Bulgaria and Hungary, institutional trust emerged as central to citizen behavior. 
In short, building and maintaining a good reputation and trust, especially related to health issues, is an essential tool for governments and public health to effectively manage future pandemics. With regard to citizen behaviors, citizen-related factors highlight the importance of demographic and attitudinal predispositions for people to enact self-protective behaviors, and demographic factors matter depending on location, culture, and timing. There isn't a single recipe for this. But a more universal citizen factor is efficacy, or our confidence in our ability to enact behaviors and our belief that those behaviors lead to positive outcomes. The evidence from across the countries very clearly concludes that as governments and public health authorities, they should be communicating three key messages. One, explaining what people should be doing. Second, providing clear instructions on how to perform the behavior correctly. And third, providing evidence that there is benefit for the people in performing these behaviors. And finally, of course, information-related factors. Popular media and scientific research widely recognize that COVID-19's infodemic poses a serious threat to persuading citizens to adopt self-protective behaviors. The bottom line is that when citizens feel like they don't have enough quality information from their governments and public health authorities, they will fill the perceived information gaps by relying on other sources of information, opening the door to myths and disinformation. But the other thing, there are two other factors affecting this. In prolonged crises, several pieces of research identified a newer challenge in information fatigue. This emerged across countries like Germany, Italy, and Lithuania. People were simply tired of hearing about COVID in any way by the end of it. And finally, where there are lower levels of information literacy, that is being able to discern good information from bad, citizens are more likely to be resistant to adopting self-protective behaviors that are recommended or even required by governments and public health. Next slide, please. So while it is obvious to say that good pandemic communication practice is necessary, good pandemic communication practice requires planning, adaptability, and a very strong connection to citizens and citizen attitudes. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor. And I immediately give the floor to Mrs. Jacob. Oh, we don't have any sound. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Now we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Cecile Jacob. I'm a senior consultant at VVA Brussels, and it's my pleasure to present the second component of this study, um, focused on misinformation and disinformation practices um, related to COVID-19 um, and their countermeasures in the EU. Um, next slide, please. Uh, uh, so I will first recall the methods we use for this study to analyze um, disinformation and misinformation practices. Uh, and then I will uh, walk you through um, the different practices, the key themes of COVID disinformation we analyzed. Um, we also discussed about third countries' interference um, in uh, disinformation across the EU uh, to conclude on countermeasures and ways to improve these countermeasures. Next slides, please. So for this study, we also analyzed um, a number of uh, scientific publications and reports. And uh, for this section, we focused on uh, nine EU uh, member states, which are listed here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, first of all, I would like um, to give you an overview of the concept of disinformation and uh, misinformation that we describe in our study. Um, a first finding of our study is that there is no shared definition on disinformation 
um, although common aspects of uh, defining these two uh, concepts exist. Um, for example, the uh, ERGA's approach to this information um, uh, combines the following elements, so the existence of false or misleading information, the intention to cause harm or gain profit, uh, and uh, it often works with the assistance of well-funded and automated technology. Overall, unlike misinformation, disinformation is characterized by the presence of a deliberate intention to cause harm. Um, moving to the next slide. Um, desk research indicated that there are um, seven types of uh, disinformation, misinformation practices um, that you can see on the screen. Uh, for example, to illustrate in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, if we discuss about manipulated content linked to disinformation, uh, we can mention a blog that manipulated contact, content of a scientific study uh, claiming that uh, mRNA uh, vaccine changed the DNA of patients. Uh, there were also conspiracy theories from non-state actors uh, blaming social, social groups and certain uh, ethnic minorities for spreading the COVID-19 pandemic. When it comes to misinformation practices, we can mention uh, memes, so uh, small pieces of uh, videos tending to exaggerate uh, side effects of vaccine, uh, therefore increasing mistrust in their safety. Uh, we can also mention um, users of social media platforms claiming that the COVID-19 couldn't be transmitted in hot and humid climates. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to talk about the most prevalent themes in the COVID-19 disinformation. Um, the largest share of false or misleading information concerned vaccination and immunization uh, of about 24%, uh, followed by the severity of the COVID-19, government responses to COVID-19, and uh, conspiracy theories surrounding the pandemic. Uh, in this study, we found that uh, the spread of such uh, disinformation and misinformation practices had an impact on public opinion. For ex instance, uh, according to a UK study, exposure to uh, misinformation was responsible for around a 6% decrease in the intent of vaccination. Uh, another study found that uh, these practices gave rise to uh, um, uncooperative behavior among the general population, therefore undermining uh, compliance with the emergency measures. In the next slide, um, I will present another section of our study in which we analyze the role of uh, and impact of third countries in disinformation across the EU. Our study showed or rather confirmed that Russia and China were the two third countries uh, at the front line of COVID-19 disinformation. Uh, we focused uh, our research on the media they used to spread disinformation as well as the, their different intention. Uh, in both cases, Russia and China used disinformation for geopolitical advancements. Um, and um, these um, uh, false or misleading foreign narratives uh, from the EU side were monitored through the use of the rapid alert systems against disinformation. Um, to conclude, although the overall impact is difficult to define and to quantify, um, it led uh, EU citizens to question the credibility of the EU uh, and uh, of also national and regional authorities, triggering uh, official health advice to be ignored. In the next slide, uh, we will discuss the countermeasure taken uh, against these uh, practices. 
So um, the e European Commission called on social media and platform to it intensify their role to counteract COVID-19 disinformation uh, by joining the 2018 Code of Practice on Disinformation. And platform will also ask to publish baseline reports um, on their uh, policies and action to address COVID-19 disinformation. At national level, we analyze emergency measures tackling disinformation on COVID-19 in nine member states. Um, in some member states, um, plans were made or uh, actually action were taken to change legislation uh, to criminalize uh, the dissemination of false information. It's worth mentioning that uh, Hungary was the only member state that passed a law to counter disinformation related to COVID-19. Um, connected to that, all member states introduced restriction on freedom of assembly, except uh, Sweden. Um, and it's uh, very important to, to point that, uh, as underlined by the Venice Commission, uh, limitation to the freedom of expression um, must be kept to a minimum, even in emergencies. Uh, parliament, parliamentary control over restrictive measures must be kept. And all these uh, restrictions uh, had a, uh, an impact on fundamental rights. Um, in the next slide, um, I will present um, the ways to improve these countermeasures. Uh, we actually analyzed the expected role of the uh, strengthened code of practice on disinformation uh, together with the DSA. Um, as seen in this pandemic, social media and platforms were a key uh, channel for spreading disinformation uh, surrounding COVID-19, and it further revealed the shortcoming of the 2018 Code of Practice on Disinformation. This led um, uh, 34 signatories to ratify the Strengthened Code of Practice on Disinformation in June of this year. Uh, which follows a co-regulatory framework interlinked with the DSA and aims to address the shortcoming uh, identified in, this, in the previous code and uh, further revealed with the pandemic. Beyond the EU code and the DSA, uh, we recommend in our study uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation and further coordination on a common transparency reporting, especially from the platform side, as well as further international cooperation uh, between third countries and international organization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, to both speakers, and I immediately go to the political groups for questions. Mr. Kimporopoulos, please. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I would like to thank also uh, the, uh, the dear speakers uh, for the very comprehensive study. Countering disinformation and misinformation amidst an information overload was a major test for our institutions. Disinformation spread by foreign state-sponsored campaigns aimed at the effect at effect our country's responses to the pandemic. At the same time, misinformation proliferated through social media as people were looking for answers. Mm -hmm. They fundamentally tried to amplify citizens' fear and undermine their trust, a key element in our fight against mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The response from the EU and the other member states was decisive with a number of measures including the Digital Service Act, increased transparency in political advertising, a strengthened code of practice on disinformation, and the mobilization of EU funds to increase citizens' media literacy. And this parliament is at the, is at the front line of these efforts with the establishment of a special committee on foreign interference in all democratic process in the EU, and it will continue to do so. However, these challenges will, will be with us the years to come, and we need to continue equipping the EU with the right tools to address them. 
We need a United and Authentic approach towards third actors meddling in Europe's democracy. We need to work with digital platforms to address the roots of disinformation and misinformation, but also to empower citizens to make informed decisions through education, digital and media literacy. So I would like to know and to ask you what other measures would you, you, would you recommend in this regard? Thank you very much. Sara, please. Ah. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathleen. So many p colleagues today um, indicated that they are um, medical professionals by uh, education and training. So I'm not, uh, but still I feel very convenient in this committee. But I would feel even more convenient today if I switch to my mother tongue. So I'm going to continue in German. Und ähm, ich glaube, wenn wir heute äh, allen Speakern hier, allen Rednerinnen und Rednern zugehört haben, Kommunikation ist ja neben Raketenphysik fast das äh, zweitschwerste äh, äh, und komplexeste, was wir sozusagen in der Menschheit irgendwie zu bewähren haben. Und ich würde ganz gerne auch von Frau Opri das aufgreifen, dass Sie gerade, wenn wir heute über Kommunikation und Missinformation sprechen, sozusagen auch diese, diese Impfgeschichte nochmal aufgreifen, aber um sozusagen ein Dilemma, was ich sehe und wo ich eine Frage hätte, gerade an die erste Speakerin, ähm, nochmal das aufzudröseln, äh, ob wir, wie wir damit umgehen. Denn wenn wir uns sozusagen die diese Kommunikation rund um natürlich auch in der Hochphase, wenn es um die, um die Impfung gegangen ist, dann ist es mir tatsächlich ein bisschen als Dilemma vorgekommen. Denn auf der einen Seite sind die Impfstoffe in meiner äh, Bewertung sehr, sehr sicher, aber natürlich nicht komplett ohne, ne ohne Nebenwirkungen, wie das bei allen anderen Impfungen auch vorher gewesen ist. Ähm, was aber nicht passiert ist, ist vielleicht, dass sozusagen der Fokus auf der Kommunikation hier tatsächlich das so deutlich herausgearbeitet hat. Und das Gleiche gilt auch für die 50.000 Fälle, die eben wir heute haben, wo wir sozusagen unsere Hausaufgaben noch hinterher machen müssen. Ich glaube, da müssen wir einfach besser werden. Die Frage, die ich mir stelle, ist, was ist sozusagen die Befürchtung von Politik? Und ich sage das mal sehr äh, parteiungebunden aus einer Vogelperspektive. Was ist sozusagen die Befürchtung von Politik vielleicht gewesen, sozusagen nicht das anzuwenden, was heute hier vorgeschlagen ist, nämlich mit größtmöglicher äh, Offenheit, mit größtmöglicher Transparenz äh, sozusagen in diese Debatte hineinzugehen, weil man vielleicht dann doch vermutet hat oder die Befürchtung hatte, dass man diese Impfkampagne nicht so erfolgreich fahren kann, wie man sie gefahren hat, weil im Endeffekt hat es Millionen von Menschenleben geredet. Denn, und ich, das hat Herr, äh, Herr Lukas gerade sehr, sehr schön gesagt, in dieser pluralen Gesellschaft haben wir eben halt sehr viele Menschen, die auch sehr viel Blödsinn erzählen. Müssen wir das am Endeffekt sozusagen in der, Demo in der Demokratie einfach aushalten? Oder reagiert Politik vielleicht, ich sage es mal so, ein bisschen zurückhaltender dann in der Kommunikation, weil man eben weiß, dass die Berichterstattung nicht zwingend überall sachlich ist, denn nicht alle reden, äh, lesen den Economist oder die Frankfurter Zeitung, sondern es gibt ja auch noch ein paar andere Zeitungen, die ja was verbreiten. Und die äh, sozialen Medien gleicher, äh, gleicherweise sind sozusagen auch nicht die sachlichsten. Und was man dann sozusagen auch von der äh, rechten Seite dieses Hauses und auch der Gesellschaft erlebt, wir haben das heute ja auch wieder einen Geschmack davon bekommen, was da wie narrative Realitätsverdrehung, Opferrollen, ab abstruse Narrative aufgebaut werden, ist das sozusagen das, was einen als Politikerin und Politiker dann sozusagen davon abhält, sozusagen das anzuwenden, was heute eigentlich vorgeschlagen wird, nämlich diese größtmögliche Transparenz und diese Sachlichkeit auf den Tisch zu legen. Müssen wir das aushalten oder ist sozusagen, was sind die Empfehlungen, damit wir in die nächste Krise wirklich viel, viel besser gewappnet hineingehen können, um Kommunikation am Endeffekt noch, noch ein Stückchen besser äh, zu generieren in der Europäischen Union. Vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Um, it's not very easy now to see for, we, for whom the question is, because it's one study. And so I'll, I'll give first the, the, the floor to Professor Diers Larsen and then Mrs. Jacob, if you want to add something, you can of course do so. And then the other way around, something like that. Mrs. Uh, yeah, Diers Larsen, please. The, I mean, the two big questions that we have from the speakers are what are their measures and, and also how do we deal effectively with the challenging communication environment? And in some ways, the top line of the response to this is that governments need to do a better job and health institutions need to do a better job of building long-term institutional trust. 
One of the things that we see in sharp contrast is that in institutional environments, and this was predictive in almost every country and with vaccination uh, research, which I work on, it is, it is predictive that if people have trust in their institutions, they're much more willing to listen to the information. So this means that over time, governments and politicians have to be more transparent. We are living in an age where the expectation for communication engagement and direct engagement is higher. This is part of the, I think, benefit of the social media age. We, we speak a lot about the negative sides of the, the social media age, but it does mean that people expect. And let me give you an example of, of a politician who I think did an excellent job of this, was the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. She was accessible ev almost every single day for press conferences. Her government also used social media as a major means of dissemination of information what they did is, is they had the same problems and the same challenges of should we mask, should we not, how to deal with vaccination. But they created a dialogue on a daily basis. Then this is also true in research from Scandinavia, which are high trust environments. It's not surprising that lower trust environments fail to communicate and fail to build the conversation with, with their citizens. So what can we do and how do we combat all of this? It's not the assumption that people are, are crazy or daft. People are looking out for their own self-interests. If, if we can set aside genuine anti-vaxxers, for example, for a moment, and only look at the vaccine hesitant, people are hesitant about vaccines, not because they're anti-establishment, but because they have concerns. And if they don't feel like their concerns are being heard, then they're much less likely to, to take that leap of faith. And especially if they don't think that their institution is trustworthy. So there's both the long-term element of, of making sure that we use institutions of good health or of good reputation. Now, in some countries, um, I believe Bulgaria was one of these, was where there wasn't great inst uh, government trust. There was trust in the health service. And that was the case in a lot of countries around the EU and around the world, was if there wasn't great trust in the governments, at least if they have a functioning health industry and health sector, they were trustworthy. So trying to identify what, where there are trust deficits and deal with that is the long term. The short term is translating the science much more effectively. People need to feel like they're being spoken with, not at, and not trying to have cover up. That's, that's never going to work, especially in crisis. Crisis is about uncertainty. Reduce uncertainty, and you have people who are much more likely to respond well and to be more open to the, the recommendations. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Jacob. Do you want to add? No, you're muted again, Mrs. Jacob. Nope. No. Nope. Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Jacob, if the line on the speak button is red, that means that we can hear you. So I will do it now for you. Now it turned red, it means that we can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I think my colleague responded very resp uh, comprehensively to, to the question from the audience, so I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> we'll come back to you later then. Mrs. Trillet Lenoir. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je voudrais moi aussi m'associer aux félicitations et aux remerciements de mes collègues pour euh, la pertinence de vos études et surtout pour leur caractère très concret et comparatif. Alors la première question que j'avais l'intention de vous poser, c'était de savoir si vous aviez pu trouver une corrélation entre la lutte contre la désinformation dans certains États membres et le taux de vaccination. En fait, vous avez fait mieux. Vous avez montré une corrélation entre les politiques de lutte contre la désinformation et la mortalité par Covid. 
Donc là, je crois que le critère majeur de santé publique est, est atteint. Deux questions plus secondaires, mais néanmoins importantes, pour ce qui s'agit de la coercition, la peur du gendarme. Est-ce que dans les pays où les politiques de désinformation ont été pénalisées, vous avez constaté une meilleure adhésion à la vaccination Et puis une question concernant le « fast checking », est-ce que dans les pays ou dans les situations où le fast-checking est activé, est-ce qu'on assiste à un impact supérieur des politiques de lutte contre la désinformation Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Euh, Madame Rivasi. Merci. Alors, moi j'avais une question à vous poser pour savoir si on est dans le monde de la désinformation, de la mésinformation, du mensonge d'État. Où est-ce qu'on est, qu est Je vous, vais vous prendre l'exemple qui s'est passé en Allemagne, où il y a eu une enquête du journal Die Welt qui a montré que euh, le ministre de l'Intérieur a utilisé dans sa communication sur le Covid des messages et des chiffres alarmistes afin de faire peur et fabriquer un soutien aux mesures de confinement. Alors qu'est-ce qu'il a fait eh ben, il est allé voir des chercheurs en disant « essayer de m'établir le pire scénario ». Et donc, il a joué sur les chiffres de morts euh, par rapport au Covid et en disant « si le gouvernement n'agit pas, 70% de la population pourrait être infectée, le nombre de morts pourrait s'élever à des millions ». Et il a cessé de répéter ça, c'était le ministre Siofer, en mars et en avril 2020. Est-ce que ça, pour vous, c'est une stratégie qui fait mieux accepter le fait d'avoir des mesures plus coercitives, parce qu'il y avait le confinement, il fallait pousser des gens à se faire vacciner, etc. Donc, voilà, moi je trouve qu'on parle de désinformation, tout ça, mais qui l'a fait, à quel niveau Donc là, il a été quand même très critiqué, et j'aurais voulu avoir votre avis. Merci, Merci. beaucoup. Madame Yoron. Merci. Alors aujourd'hui, cette commission Covid est censée débattre de la désinformation, comme le PDG de Pfizer, Albert Bourla. Aucun responsable des médias sociaux n'a souhaité venir ici et je remercie le secrétariat qui a tenté de les joindre. La désinformation, c'est quoi C'est un ensemble de techniques de communication visant à tromper des personnes ou l'opinion publique pour protéger des intérêts privés ou non, ou influencer l'opinion publique. Pendant trois ans de Covid, la Commission européenne a mis le paquet en élaborant un code de désinformation. empêcher tout débat, toute question, toute autre analyse sur ces injections obligatoires et expérimentales. Je vais vous donner quelques exemples. Euh, on a eu Madame Small ici qui déclare que les vaccins n'ont pas été testés sur sa capi leur capacité à empêcher la transmission du virus avant leur mise sur le marché. Est-ce que c'est de la désinformation Twitter file. Il y a eu, une, il y a eu question euh, essentiellement de la politique de modération de contenu et de collaboration du réseau social avec des instances officielles sur les champs Covid. Est-ce que c'est de la désinformation Une vidéo de Bill Gates au Lovie Institute du 23 janvier 2023 déclare que les vaccins anti-Covid ne bloquent pas l'infection, ne sont pas efficaces contre les variants et leur durée de vie est très courte. Est-ce que c'est de la désinformation Vidéo de Project Veritas où un cadre de Pfizer déclare « Covid va probablement être une vache à lait pour nous » Pour quelques temps, nous faisons des mutations de structures sélectionnées pour voir si on peut rendre le virus plus puissant. Pourquoi ne pas muter nous-mêmes le virus afin de produire à l'avance le nouveau vaccin Je soupçonne que c'est la faction dont le virus a démarré à Wuhan. Est-ce que c'est de la désinformation Monsieur Walker serait donc le directeur de la recherche et du développement en charge des opérations stratégiques et de la planification scientifique de l'ARN messager chez Pfizer. C'est donc une bombe informative de la manipulation du virus du Covid pour diriger son évolution qui n'a reçu quasiment aucun écho dans les grands médias mainstream, à part Twitter, et aussi, on peut voir, toutes les autres plateformes ont censuré la vidéo. Pourtant, Pfizer, dans son communiqué le 27 janvier, à 20h, n'a pas démenti que cet individu aurait travaillé chez eux dans ses fonctions. Et Pfizer a confirmé qu'il pratique bien l'ingénierie de virus. Qui donne l'ordre de censurer ces vidéos Qui a coordonné la pression sur Google, TikTok et les autres les rapports de l'EMA qui relatent plus de 25% d'effets secondaires graves, est-ce que c'est de la désinformation Pourquoi le PDG de Pfizer fuit les questions à Davos comme un coupable Est-ce que c'est de la désinformation Finalement, qui décide du narratif officiel Qui dirige 
Bruxelles ou les Big Pharma. Depuis trois ans, des médecins, des virologues, des élus ont été censurés ou éloignés des débats publics quand ils ont osé parler d'alternatives à l'injection ou des effets toxiques, voire mortels des injections sur les femmes et les jeunes. Des soignants, je le répète, je le répète sont toujours suspendus en France et les victimes d'effets secondaires se comptent par milliers. Mais Ceux qui voulaient un... lutter contre la désinformation ont en fait, je trouve, utilisé cet outil pour leur propre propagande. Les Big Pharma se frottent les mains. Trois minutes. Hein. Um, okay, I don't know uh, whether the authors of this excellent study are able to um, to sort of make a yes or no on uh, uh, this information. So um, uh, I will start with Mrs. Uh, Jacob and, and please answer what you can answer of the questions, um, Mrs. Jacob. Thank you. Um, so. Although we didn't analyze uh, whether uh, the member states uh, in which uh, legislation was passed to criminalize um, disinformation uh, had an impact on the vaccination rate, uh, we can say for sure that um, any legislation uh, that um, try to regulate disinformation in a very vague and unspecific language Um, can also restrict access to information and uh, prevent citizens from uh, formulating their own opinions. So uh, this could um, uh, suggest that uh, uh, the vaccination rate wouldn't be higher in this case. Mrs. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Dirs Lawson, can you add something, please? Yeah, there's the two questions about silencing dissent and what constitutes disinformation and then the fear question. I think the, the biggest risk in silencing dissent, whether that's on social media or anywhere else, versus directly confronting it, is actually you create the environment for mis- and disinformation to grow. So I actually think it is quite unhealthy and impractical because there are no ways to, to genuinely silence the dissent and to silence concerns. But what organizations can do, institutions, governments can do, is when they try and quelch the debate, it, they do so out of a fear that it will confuse people. But I think that this is, this is underestimating people's ability to understand information and to make reasonable, rational decisions for themselves. So rather than silence debate, there is a, a communication theory called inoculation theory. And just like, ironically, talking about vaccines, t you do two-sided argumentation. You give a little bit an, a fair accounting of the opposition and then you respond to it. This, I think, is a far better approach, and especially in conditions of uncertainty, than it is to truly silence the dissent. So my caution as a communication scholar is that you will only create the conditions for more desire for the, the banned information or silenced information by doing so. And actually, that dovetails well into the fear issue. Fear in and of itself is already going to be there in, in the pandemic. And so uh, with the gentleman's example of Germany, my example of English approach, which was to amplify fear, we actually see that it had a, a genuinely damaging effect in terms of self-protective behavior compliance, whether that is with vaccination or whether it is face masking or, or anything else, that when the two strategies of amplifying fear and also forced compliance are used, you will have people who, if they feel like they have to obey the letter of the law, they will, but they won't end up learning anything about transmission. You know, one of the side effects of, of the COVID pandemic is actually there are significantly lower levels of, of stomach-related dysentery kinds of issues in hospitals um, now because people are simply practicing better hygiene. So this is why the, th the three recommendations for good communication practice, which all centers around a positive message, is 
keep people informed as much as there is. And this was a changeable environment. Being honest about what we know and what we don't know is part of the, the, the challenge. Providing people with concrete recommendations for their behavior and also and demonstrating how to do the behaviors correctly, but providing the best possible evidence for, for the effectiveness of those behaviors those are the really the best ways to address it. So if you combine that with the two-sided, the inoculation approach, you recognize people's fears, you legitimize their concerns, and then you give as the best information at any point. It may change. And then you talk about the narrative of, we now understand more about the disease. And that's in places where there is good communication success. That's exactly what they did. Thank you very much for that clear answer. Um, Mrs. De La Pizza, please. Micro, micro. Muchas gracias a nuestra invitada por estar aquí. Hoy usted ha mencionado la necesidad de reforzar la confianza con las instituciones. Quizá hoy primero toque todavía superar la desconfianza que se ha creado. ¿Cómo se puede hacer? Porque parece que el espíritu crítico no es, el no es la principal característica de quienes han gobernado, que nos han gobernado durante la pandemia. Vemos cómo la comunidad científica está valorando la situación y sí que tienen algo de espíritu crítico, pero a nivel político pues no está ocurriendo. Por lo menos en mi país se ha comprometido a la democracia y sentencias donde se declara, de declara inconstitucional los estados de alarma. También se ha visto cómo el certificado COVID ha vulnerado derechos fundamentales, pero... No vemos que nadie pida disculpas, nadie rinde cuentas. Esta sensación de impunidad parece que da un poder extra, ¿no? dejando a los ciudadanos pues, más vulnerables. Genera una sensación de que son una pisonadora que no va a cejar en su intención de minar libertades. Todo con un per pretexto perfecto, como es la salud. Vemos también cómo la financiación de la Organización Mundial de la Salud compromete su autonomía de decisiones teniendo como inversores primordiales los agentes privados que tienen intereses. ¿no? Vemos también cómo la Unión Europea a la vez les concede todavía más soberanía en las decisiones. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Mrs. Cerdas, please. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you to both speakers for... Uh, your input and your presentation on the on the study and uh, uh, many questions have been asked now and I would like to in reflect on why uh, on one of the reasons why Portugal uh, had such uh, success on vaccines and on vaccination rates against COVID-19. This is due to societal memory as uh, 50 years ago, uh, vaccines were not available widely and people still remember nowadays what it is like to perish from rubella, diphtheria, measles, and even polio to have their kids paralyzed or even have difficulties uh, breeding. I have a concrete question for Professor Dears Lawson. Uh, you explain uh, that one of the measures we can have to counteract this is to reduce uncertainty. Uh, but how can we reduce uncertainty uh, when we are facing a very scientific fast dynamic event such as a pandemic, such, such as it was in COVID-19. At the beginning, masks were not uh, appropriate. Then we were uh, holding the masks for those that really were on the frontline health professionals. Then it was, um, it was uh, evidence that masks helped. So this whole dynamics, how can we reduce uncertainty when we have a fast-paced information? And um, you also say that one of the, the, your uh, suggestions is not to silence the dissent, but also to counter explain. So I'll try here uh, to also share that vaccines were deemed safe and effective to avoid death or severe disease for an individual. Unfortunately, there was hope for herd immunity, uh, which did not materialize. It also does not materialize, for instance, for the tetanus vaccine to give 
an example and for us to have a better understanding that this can apply to some vaccines and not some on others. Um, we might have here in this committee questions about how the contracts for the vaccines were made, the prices, the doses, uh, but on safety, I think we have been uh, very well enlightened by the health authorities about the safety profiles of these vaccines. Thank you very much. Ms. Paulus? Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you for being here and for presenting us the study. As my colleagues have already elaborated on a lot of things, I would like to learn whether in your study you have also looked at the problem of false balance, because that is the other side of um, leaving an open space for differing opinions, for um, uncomfortable questions, for doubts, for critical interventions, because I know that the media love to have one person from each side. But unfortunately, if you have like 100 people who say the vaccines work and one person who says it doesn't, then it might not be the best idea to have them both in the same show and presenting it at a 50 50, um, uh, as a 50 50 issue. Therefore, I would like to know did you also look at this in your study? Thanks. Thank you very much. And finally, Mrs. Anderson. I don't have anybody else on my list. Mrs. Anderson, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, study. And I'm really glad that I'm actually here and, and listening to you because um, I will have to tell you this study comes across as something entirely different than what you probably intended uh, with the study. Um, I would just like to point out on page 21 uh, under cap, uh, number three, you write, provide evidence that there is benefit. So you're asking the governments to provide benefit that there is uh, evidence that there is benefit um, to what they want the people to do. But see, that is exactly the problem. They did not provide any evidence. They immediately uh, went on with threatening people, publicly shaming them, uh, ostracizing them, uh, threatening them they would have to pay for their, for their treatment themselves and, and all of these things. And then I found it interesting that on um, page 20, um, you did mention countries that used fear-based messaging or emphasized punishment for non-compliance had lower levels of compliance. And I do get from that and from, from what I heard here today uh, that you do not agree with uh, tactics like that. But yet... On page 18, you talk about or pretty much uh, praise Germany for having had good communication practices. And I really wonder, and it, any German reading this study, they will take it, it, it just adds insult to injury. Did you not know what the German government did with the people? Did you not know that they ostracized them, publicly shamed them? They told them you won't no longer have a uh, job if you don't get vaccinated. They told them you will have to pay for your treatment yourself if you don't get vaccinated. Vaccinated. I mean, how can you write that in your study? And I do see that you had good intentions. So my question is, what actually was the goal of that study? And are you at all concerned about that your study contributes to the government's knowledge to more effectively undermine democracy and more effectively violate fundamental rights? Thank you. That concludes uh, all the questions that we have from our committee. Um, Professor uh, Diers Lawson, um, can I give you the floor, please? Sure. And um, let me let me frame the the first res the overall response is that the when we're talking about good and bad examples of communication, and Ms. Anderson is is. Right to point out that we, my general recommendation is that negative messaging is not particularly effective. However, I would point her to page 17 where we clarify based on the research that had been done, German, Germany's particular strengths were the digitization of information and cohesive instructive communication. Now, what hasn't been led, and keep in mind that this was a literature-based review, um, so to the extent about public shame, that hasn't been explored yet in the literature. So based on my 
analysis of it in where that was, and also in my own research of it, where that has been true in, say, the UK, particularly in England, it's not particularly effective. And so this is where some of the conversations and some of the challenges that I know already exist in Germany probably come from is you have some very good examples of communication practice backed up with problematic policy. I won't play, go into the politics of it. The intention of this study was to summarize and reflect on what has been empirically demonstrated to be useful and unuseful. And so in that case, when we look at some of the other questions and comments, the question about false balance, while this particular study did not look at, at the journalism, um, I would generally concur with the, the lady's response was that is indeed false balance isn't helpful. Um, because it creates the illusion that all sides are equal and it gives equal airtime without a critical response. And in some ways, the, the media's love of false, false balance, I think, does create additional problems in terms of how do you present information in a way that is both fair and also in a way that acknowledges where there are strengths and where there are weaknesses. And that is, in fact, what we've tried to do. So when we come to some of the strengths of countries, when we look at digitization, or in Portugal's case, certainly institutional history has been, is probably a good accounting, but what the other things that they did that were particularly strong were cross-platform and instructive communication. And I think that this is, I hope that this is what has come across quite clearly in that portion, is that the best communication strategies focus on the positive ones. And whether the politicians are the best suited for presenting the information, or whether it's public health that is best suited at presenting the information, what's absolutely essential is that it is done in a way that deals with the best information at a time. So yes, the uncertainty is going to be there in a fast-moving health crisis, and especially in something like COVID, for example, where we didn't know what was going on at, at a lot of different points. So you, I would go back to the example of the First Minister of Scotland, who maintained the daily communication effort to narrate and explain what was changing why it was changing it, and then bring in health experts to, to very directly say, here's why our thinking on this has changed. People will be willing to go with it if they feel that they're being communicated with honestly and as adults. And, and for the democratization of issues, this is where many countries fell down. As I said at the beginning, no country got it absolutely right. There are things that we can learn and replicate, and there are things that we should avoid. And so we should avoid negativity, fear, compliance where possible, and we should emphasize self-efficacy and strength of response. Thank you very much. Mrs. Uh, Jacob, do you want to add uh, something or... No, thank you. My colleague answer very precisely. Okay, she does, doesn't she? Um, can I, can I, um, um, well, thank uh, both authors um, and, and, and speakers. Um, I think it was excellent, and I invite all of us to have a close look to the to the study as well as as for other studies that we shoot. Um, and I'm not going to make conclusions. That's all, all, almost always impossible. Uh, but uh, there is some similarity. Well, there's a lot of similarity between the first part and the second part. Um, and, and I think they were very good in, in, in keeping a balance. Uh, but both Mr. Lucas as Mrs. Audra Dears Lawson said something that is extremely important for us. This is not a committee that will judge the different measures that has been taken by national governments and, and uh, Nobody is 100% right because this pandemic, um, it all happened uh, to us and it was doing by learning and it's our uh, task to do the lessons learned and, um, and that goes for uh, misinformation and disinformation as well. So um, thank you very much to everybody who participated in this afternoon's uh, hearing. Again, very important um, things that we've learned uh, that we will put in our report. Um, that are the lessons learned um, uh, to be more prepared for the next uh, pandemic at the European level. That, that, 
let that be the main task of this committee. Thank you very much, and I see you all tomorrow, 9 o'clock. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>